Yes, it was nice to see this morning that there was already a long introduction on uh, neuromorphic and deep networks, spiking, non-spiking. I will be focusing mainly on, uh, on spiking processors. The first thing I would like to do is to give credit to the people that actually did the work, and, and these are uh, the ones. Ning, Sabet, and Fabio were the ones that came up with the ideas and designs together with me. Ning was designing actually the whole chip, and uh, Sabet and Fabio were also mainly working on the theory and modeling aspects. And Elisa and Dong Chen have been using the chip to show you some of the results. The, the, it was also argued this morning, what is neuromorphic, where does it come from? I just want to point out there are basically two main lines of uh, research in this field. One is the more recent one that uh, we've seen come up also with the creation of this nice workshop that's building dedicated hardware, not necessarily uh, only spiking networks. Uh, that is uh, mainly geared or also geared towards high performance computing. It is application driven. We have very nice examples even in this workshop on, on uh, devices and systems that can be used to solve real practical world applications. But the term nor neuromorphic was actually coined uh, in the late 80s, mid early 90s by Carver, Carver Mead at Caltech with this nice group of students. Corbin is here. He will also be able to tell you all the anecdotes about this time of, uh, of Caltech, which was really exciting. And uh, it was really not driven by applications. It was really uh, fundamental research. Here we see Misha Maholt, who was the first student of Carver, who was a biologist, had not seen a transistor before, and uh, together with Carver started pioneer this whole world. And uh, the idea was really to use the physics of silicon to emulate neural functions. And of course, the, uh, using both uh, analog and digital, the best of both worlds, it's really an opportunistic strategy to use whatever works uh, to, in this case, understand how the brain works. It's really basic research. And the type of uh, research that we've been doing at the University of Zurich, it's a university, it follows this line. It's just to show, to say that it's not uh, mainly driven by making money like a brain chip, but really to understand how the brain wor works by building it. So we are not building computing or simulation structures for neuroscientists. We are neuroscientists that use microelectronics as an additional tool to understand how the brain works. So we don't have the problem of giving high precision to, to users that, that uh, require some high precision for their ODE solvers, which some of other people have problems with. So in, in fact, the whole point of the research that we do at the Institute of Neuroinformatics, INI, is, is uh, to try to understand how the brain works by doing anatomy, physiology, all of the standard tool set of neuroscientists. Uh, we derive models which are as close as possible to the, the real physics of uh, what's going on in the, in the cortex, in the hippocampus, in different parts of the brain. We try to abstract these models so that they are uh, manageable, uh, either with MATLAB or, or Python or larger scale simulation systems that we also build in hardware, dedicated chips that implement some of these models. As I said, to try to uh, reproduce the biophysics. So we, we're not trying to build uh, ODE solvers or emulation or simulation engines. It's really try to build small cortical circuits in silicon that can somehow reproduce the physics of the, the ones we measure by looking at uh, rats, monkeys, cats, zebra finch, and the other animal models we have in the institute. So the, it's really highly interdisciplinary. We, we really need to study the language of biology we do neuroscience, we train our students to become expert neuroscientists, but also how to do computation. So they have to study computer science, nonlinear dynamical systems, device physics, microelectronics, and more recently, material science, because this uh, emerging memory technologies domain is really interesting from the point of view of the physics that can be used to reproduce the biophysics of synapses, which are really complex structures. Uh, then we, in order to, to get things interesting to happen, we try to design chips that exploit the physics of silicon. So we use analog, but also we use digital to take advantage of the fast, uh, fast uh, signal transmission speeds that we have. And so we have both analog and digital mixed signal chips. And we, throughout the years, from the time in which Quobin and I were at Caltech, we learned how to get the two things together without interfering too much. There is a lot of crosstalk if you're not careful. But we have now, by now, a lot of experience to try to, to get rid of this crosstalk. And then, of course, we try to see if intelligence can emerge out of these systems. And our argument is that this can only happen if these uh, systems have a body. And so then, once we have these compact, small, low-power devices, we try to put them on a body. We will see with uh, Yulia Sandomirskaya's talk also how this can uh, lead to interesting 
discoveries using analog and digital solutions that we have here. So the type of chips, just to summarize, that we, uh, that we do have basically circuits that uh, receive spikes in input, produce spikes in output. This is the first approximation that we make. They're digital all or none event. Uh, you probably know well the action potentials have a particular function, uh, a particular shape. But we, we simplify and we just consider these as events, uh, which are uh, all or none, so they're digital. The circuits inside are analog. We use uh, uh, diffusion in order to get Boltzmann statistics, just like ions diffuse across proteic channels from inside and outside of the cell. That's what I mean by saying that we exploit the physics of silicon. Because we have diffusion in single transistor channels, we can emulate diffusion in proteic channels across nerve membranes. Uh, but we also use digital asynchronous for transmitting signals across long distances. We use spikes, just like biology does. Uh, as a consequence, the type of chips that we build have these massively parallel arrays of these analog circuits, which compute in a distributed fashion. Because we can transmit many, many signals, many fast signals to all of these neurons, all of these synapses and neurons in parallel, the slow dynamics that take place uh, are uh, massively parallel. Slow dynamics. Slow meaning that here we have circuits in which time represents itself. If we want to reproduce the biophysics of real neurons, we try to reproduce also their time constants, which are, as you know, of the orders of tens, uh, 10, 20, 50, even 100, 500 milliseconds. And in some cases, if we look at other processes, not just single signups, we also try to get uh, hours or days. And we've, we managed to design a circuit that allows a few electrons per second to flow through. So we have a leakage rates of really more than a day. So, and that allows us to have these multiple time scales in which time just flows continuously. Time represents itself. It's what Carver used to say as well. And that's how we get these biologically plausible temporal dynamics. Uh, in order to cope with the fact that we have analog and subthreshold, therefore we have mismatch, device mismatch noise, thermal fluctuations. If we want to build robust computation, we have to learn to use the tricks that biology uses. So we have to look at populations of neurons. Any single device will be extremely noisy, very unreliable. So we look at populations of these modules, and we implement feedback, negative feedback with different types of adaptation. Uh, it could be spike-based learning at the single synapse level. It could be homeostatic learning, synaptic scaling, for example, at the whole dendritic tree level, and, and a network type feedback with winner-take-all or other types of um, adaptation uh, feedback loops at multiple spatial and temporal scales. Remember, this is all, is full, it's all analog, so it's continuous time. And also, the digital part is fully asynchronous. There is no clock. You're not burning power just because you're cycling through when nothing's happening. If there is no data coming in, all of these circuits are passive. There is no op-amps. Everything is done by charging capacitors and then letting them leak. So it's extremely low power. And there are, uh, yeah, as I said, no, no amplifiers, no active circuits. Um, doing the layout is still the, of these mixed signal analog digital is still an art. There is no automated tools that allow you to just instantiate uh, optimized silicon neuron circuits. And in fact, many of the peripheral layouts for the asynchronous circuits we actually learned to do from Kwabena, who uh, at the early times was designing all the asynchronous interfacing circuits. And then uh, the nice thing is that even though the circuits are hardwired, once you design the layout and you fabricate the chip, those equations cannot change. You don't have the flexibility as you have, for example, in Spinnaker. We still have some flexibility by changing parameters. All of the parameters of the analog circuits allow us to change time constants, refractory periods, adaptation rates. And we can change the, the network connectivity, the topology. Because if we're using asynchronous digital circuits, we can use asynchronous routers which have memory, and we can change the, the lookup tables to, to have feed-forward networks, recurrent networks, combinations of feed-forward and recurrent, and you'll see examples. So we still can play and try out different network architectures to either do modeling of the brain or to try to solve problems by using the, the fact that we have digital spikes and we have lookup tables, uh, either off-chip or on-chip. So there is some flexibility that is not lost just by doing analog. So we're using the best of both worlds. We're using analog inside, low power, digital for outside, for chip to chip or core to core. And then we can use that also for reprogrammability. This is the latest chip. This is the title of the talk. is this uh, 28 FTSOI process uh, chip that has uh, four cores. Remember, we are a university. We're just looking. Uh, we're doing prototypes just to experiment and explore. And because we wanted to explore different routing strategies and different adaptation rates and learning circuits, we did the minimum possible. 
we put four cores and one, without learning and one fifth core with learning on a single die. This is scalable. Of course, you can copy paste. And you, you will see that the, the routers allow this to scale up to uh, 4,000 cores if we want to do like a true north chip with one million neurons. Uh, or you could scale it with multiple chips, like we saw with the Spinnaker board. You can just put a hexagon of these chips. Uh, in this case, it would be a square, because we, don't, we only go left, right, north, south with the I.O. pins. But you could scale up also at the chip size. Inter-core inter communication takes of the order of a few nanoseconds if you have to send these digital events. Inter-chip communication, it takes of the order of tens of nanoseconds. But it's still much, much smaller than the millisecond scales that the synapses have. So this communication jitter gets lost in the noise of the circuit because these circuits are real time. They have millisecond time constants. Uh, I'll, I'll show you the specs. But basically, what you need to know is that in each core, there is 256 neurons. Each core has its own set of parameters. So you could have a population of fast bursting cells, a population of inhibitory cells, a population of excitatory cells. And they can all be configured independently. And as I told you, you can send spikes from any one neuron to any other in any core. Uh, this one looks quite different because the, the neurons are just on the side. It's 64 neurons. And the rest is just a big memory array in which the memory is a complex synapse. So it's not just storing a value. It's actually implementing complex nonlinear dynamics on the stored value. It's really in-memory computation because you store a 4-bit value, but then you convert it into a current using short-term depression, short-term facilitation, different types of nonlinear nonlinearities and dynamics that can be programmed in these cells. I'll show you another picture of the layout. It's just the same. Uh, I'm just zooming in just to show you what one pixel looks like. And if you look at the details, you'll quickly realize that most of the area is taken up by memory. And here, we're using a standard FDSOI process. This was ST Microelectronics. Actually, our next generation is going to be 22 nanometer global foundries. We're already uh, finalizing the layout and um, of, of the neuron, I should say, not of the synapses. But here, what you'll see is that we have SRAM cells. And SRAM cells take six transistors. TCAM cells take 12 transistors. And most of the area here is memory. The, the analog circuits are actually just on the side. And here you have the memory for the routers, for the synapses, the converters from bits to currents, and then the subthreshold analog circuits that integrate them and do the dynamics, and then convert those into spikes. The idea is that if once the memristors or these resistive memory uh, will become available, which is quite soon, already TSMC announced it in 2021, we will be able to replace these with these uh, 10 by 10 by 10 nanometer devices and maybe a selector or a transistor below, which is slightly bigger. But that definitely, we will be able to have much um, higher density. So we can reduce the size of the pixel and put many, many more neurons on the same area. The other thing you should notice is that these are, are uh, using millivolts uh, as voltage and the pico amps as current. So it's, it's really uh, fractions of microwatts or nanowatts per uh, element. It's really low density. So there is no heat generation. If we, if we partner up with teams doing 3D monolithic VLSI integration, we can really put more than two layers without worrying about the heat dissipation. And we are working with Cialetti in Grenoble that's doing, uh, it's called Cool Cube. They're doing something that would allow to go up to six layers, like, the, like in the visual cortex. Yes? On the points about integrating the non-volatile memory, are you talking to the IBM Zurich team? Of course. We are in Zurich. So I'm talking with Abu Sebastian on one side and with Jean von Perin on the other, with both PCM and uh, oxide-based memories. We're working with Julie Grolier for the, mem for the uh, uh, Spintronics side, with NAMLAB in Dresden for the FIFET. We're looking at all possible options. And we are agnostic. The CMOS part here is compatible with whatever we can put in the back end of line. So with the first one that comes, we'll just grab it and, and use it. Um, yes. Here is an example of an analog circuit for the synapses. Just to give you an, an idea, they're not too complex. Our students in one semester learn to design these and, and to fab a chip that has this. It's a small number of transistors. As I told you, the, the synapses have uh, four bits. And these are the parts that we can replace with memoristic devices or spintronic or ferroelectric. And this is just CMOS part. There is one part that is taking out, reduce, removing the effect of all of the leakage currents. 
uh, in order to have to reduce the amount of current per synapse. The other part is the dynamics. So this is a differential pair with a capacitor. It's called a, a differential pair integrator. It, you can bias it by changing these global bias parameters to act as a linear filter, so you can do superposition, or as a nonlinear filter, so you can do short-term plasticity, short-term depression, and or short-term facilitation. And then you send the current down into the neuron. And the neuron circuit is very similar. It has these analog components here. Uh, you will see the same type of building blocks that does sort of the resistor capacitor type of element that you need in current mode. Here's your capacitor that's integrating the current with a resistor type uh, exponential increase. Then you have uh, comparators that compare to threshold. This is an integrate and fire neuron. It's actually an adaptive exponential integrate and fire neuron. This is the one that was proposed by the group of Gerstner that outperforms Hodgkin-Huxley models in this competition that they had a few years ago. It's nice to see that the equations that were derived by optimizing circuit design, minimizing power, actually match one-to-one -one the equations that were derived from theoreticians that match the cortical neurons. But anyways, here you have building blocks that implement um, models of sodium channels, of potassium channels, of calcium for hyperpolarizing currents for spike frequency adaptation. And at the same time, with these analog circuits, you have digital circuits that interface to the fast asynchronous logic. So this is the mixed mode. And, and we try to separate the parts of the circuits that go from 0 to VDD, you know, bang, bang, to the ones that switch by just a few millivolts. Just uh, by changing a few millivolts here, you get these exponential increases in currents. And here you see it. Whenever you, be, you receive a digital pulse, this is software simulation spice of the synaptic dynamics. You get these uh, first order linear filters. I told you, you could really bias the chip to the circuit to act as a linear filter. If you send these currents into the neuron, the neuron will integrate them. Eventually, it will reach the spiking threshold that you can control, and it will spike. There will be a refractory period, and you can re reproduce this uh, for all the neurons and all the synapses. If you send spikes in input and you look at the spikes in output, this is just to show you that you get this uh, saturating part. It's like the end of a sigmoid. And you should look at the rates. So we, we t typically operate at you know, hundreds of hertz or tens of hertz in input and ten hertz, tens of hertz in output if we want to have this biological plausible dynamics. For example, to put these on robots, to put them on speech recognition chips, gesture recognition, where the time constants of the, things, of the signals you want to recognize are of the same order. Of course, you can crank the currents up if you want to do a convolution neural, neural network or a deep network. You can get ReLU type behavior just by changing the parameters. And then you can get kilohertz for each neuron. Uh, this, again, massively in parallel. You would have 1,000 neurons firing at these rates. Um, but typically, we operate them in this regime here because we want to go at natural, biologically plausible time constants. Now, we have neurons, we have synapses, we can put them in cores, you saw that. How do we connect any one neuron, any output, to any input of any other? That's done by routing, and there is different strategies that, that the neuromorphic community has been uh, investigating for many years. Already in the 90s, there was a silicon cortex project in which the idea was to have a shared bus. Whenever one neuron in one core wanted to talk to another neuron in another core, it would send out its uh, address on a parallel bus. Uh, this is, is nice because then the latency does not change with the size, with the number, of course, but it's not scalable because the parallel bus has a fixed uh, bus uh, uh, length, and uh, you cannot add more cores than what the bus length allows you. The other approach that uh, Kwabena proposed was in Neurogrid, the Stanford project, with a tree. And uh, this is, uh, has other advantages. But it, the disadvantage that this one has is that the larger the network, the longer the latency that a spike accumulates to go from one node to a very distant one. And then this is what's used in Spinnaker. True North, this is the most flexible one. It's a 2D mesh. Actually, Spinnaker is more fancy because it also has diagonal connections. Uh, but it's the most flexible, and it allows you to send any spike with low latency to any other node from any one node. The problem with the, this approach is that it's very, uh, as uh, Rajit called it, wasteful. Rajit was the, a router designer for the True North chip. Uh, Rajit Manohar, in, uh, at the time he was in Cornell. Uh, it's very wasteful because if you have n neurons and you want to fan out to f different destinations, this is the type of uh, the amount of memory that you need to use in the routers. So it's, it, uh, it scales with the number of neurons logarithmically, and it has this f factor. And if you want to have a million neurons, this becomes significant. Your chip is going to be, in fact, the Truno chip is really huge because it's, it's using a lot of memory. SRAM is uh, expensive. 
Uh, again, at the institute, we're looking at biology. So we studied how, do, how does the brain solve this problem. The brain also has the problem of connectivity. And we noticed, if you look at a neuron, this is a picture of a 3D reconstructed neuron where the red is the axon, that would be the output. The green is the dendrite, that's the input. And if you notice, you'll, you'll see that, you'll quickly realize that it's very clustered. So whenever the neuron, the cell body sends a spike, it branches out to different areas. And then once it reaches the end of this area, of this intermediate node, it <coughs> broadcasts to a local neighborhood. So you could see this, this dendritic or axonal harborization is like broadcasting to your destinations. But you don't broadcast uniformly in a sphere. You only do it in a finite number, clustered number of uh, nodes. And so we follow the same approach to, to build cortical-like neural networks. So whenever a neuron spikes, it will first send its, uh, with a one-to point-to-point -point connectivity scheme, its, uh, its spike to intermediate nodes, which could be like the branches of the axon here. And then the intermediate nodes will broadcast to the destinations. And the destinations would be a core. So if any one neuron on any one core fires, it sends a spike to the router. The router detects where is the destination core. And once it's there, it broadcasts to the whole core, all the neurons in the core will receive this message. And only the ones that have the right tag, uh, that's why we use TCAMs, will accept the message. And by you following the scheme, again, with the help of Rajit Manohar, that had the experience of the true north, uh, Saber Moradi, who is a student of mine, uh, minimized the memory consumption. So just mathematically, you can, you can find the minimum by using this both um, source destination address and, des and uh, source address routing and destination address routing and show that you can get a square root of log n. And this is actually a really big improvement. If you look at how these things scale, just to give you an idea, using this scheme, if you have you know, 10 to the, sorry, you cannot read it, but 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 neurons, you get 2 kilobits per, per, um, per neuron. You get, you get 2 kilobits, sorry, with 10 to the 9 neurons. And here you get about 150 kilobits. So this is uh, it's really a huge improvement. And this is what's on, uh, what we actually put on that uh, chip that I showed you, the Dynap cell. Uh, this is showing how it works. Basically, if in our four cores, whenever uh, a neuron fires, it goes up to, on a tree. And then when it reaches the top level of the tree, it uses a mesh. So we're using the best of, of, of all the worlds that were proposed in the previous uh, proposals with NeuroGrid, True North, and so on. So we're combining 2D mesh, 2D tree, and multicast routing schemes all in one chip. It's everything is asynchronous. We designed all the routers using fully asynchronous. There is no clock, remember. And it's using these distributed CAM memory cells that are within the pixel in memory computing. Every synapse has its own CAM cell. There is no separate memory block and compute block like in standard von Neumann architectures. And it's scalable. So in our chip, we only have four cores. But if you had many cores, if you had four and then uh, eight and 16, you could really scale this up. You would just go up higher, high the hierarchy up the hierarchy and then go down again. For example, if a neuron in one core spikes and it wants to talk to multiple neurons, it would go to level one router for the same chip, to level two router for different chips, and then it would go down and, and reach the destinations. So this is the source, and these are all the destination nodes. Now, that's uh, how to do communication. The other core I told you in the chip has learning. So that's the, I would quickly want to go over the learning part. And uh, the learning is basically uh, based on a variant of spike time independent plasticity. We heard the term STDP earlier this morning. The theoreticians, the computational neuroscientists have been developing uh, variants of STDP for decades now. And it's been argued that the basic STDP is, is really too basic. It doesn't actually reproduce biology. And it's not powerful enough to do complex learning, like even deep networks. And there's a large set of publications that show how to go beyond basic STDP. Uh, we just learn from the computational neuroscientists. And we're now implementing these recipes in silicon. And actually, they're very nice because they're very fr hardware friendly. For example, they tell you, you don't need to do 32-bit floating point resolution. This is really nice because we could just use one, two, or four bits for our synapses. And they argue that actually using many synapses with low resolution is better than using few synapses with high resolution. They demonstrate this. Of course, if you have these many synapses with low resolution, you need redundancy. And you need a stochastic way of selecting synapses uh, in a random way, a subset of all of the synapses that you have. Otherwise, you would be introducing these correlations that Steve Ferber was saying that are very nasty for neural networks. 
So this is an example of the theory. This is what a paper from uh, Brader, Fuzi, and Sen in 2007 already, showing an example of a, of a learning rule that looks at whenever the presynaptic spike arrives, it checks the state of the membrane potential of the postsynaptic of the destination. So it's not based only on timing. It's actually looking at this internal variable, which is the membrane potential, the analog value of the membrane potential. And if upon the arrival of the presynaptic spike, the membrane potential is above the, uh, some threshold, you will have an up jump. And if it's uh, below some threshold, you will have a down jump. And uh, sending these spikes in, if this uh, memory potential is being driven stochastically, you have a stochastic gradient descent type learning algorithm. And we implemented this in hardware. That's what's on the chip that you saw. Uh, now, the older generations of chips that we used to have had capacitors. In 28 nanometer, it turns out it's uh, more compact to use a counter. So we used a 4-bit counter to implement this uh, internal variable that is being increased and decreased with the input spikes. And here you see an example in which we arrange the presynaptic and the postsynaptic spikes such that the internal variable that you don't see in this plot, the memory potential, is always on average uh, above the threshold. And so on average, we tend to increase the synaptic weight. You can just rearrange the pre- and postsynaptic inputs in a way that the memory potential tends to be on average below the threshold. And then you get uh, LTD transitions. So just by, by changing the way the inputs and the outputs are organized in time, you can actually induce uh, increases or decreases in the weight. This is a controlled experiment just to make sure that the circuits actually do what the theory uh, suggests. Uh, inside the chip, we have A to D converters that actually use address event representation, use events to monitor the analog variables that we have. So this is data from the chip. It's not simulations anymore. And here you see both the synapse and the neuron dynamics. Uh, these are uh, just, you can just poke any one neuron with a router with a address, selectable address, and look at the uh, output spikes, which represent, then you can reconstruct the analog dynamics by looking at the output spikes of this A to D decoder. So we have currents, but actually these represent the voltages of the, of the circuits inside. And this is the FF curve, so frequency in input, frequency in output of the chip. It's not simulations anymore. And you see these saturating curves. That you can change the saturation level by changing the refractory period. You can change the slope by changing the time constant of the neuron. You have many analog parameters that allow you to change flexibly the transfer function of the neuron. For example, if you, if you want to go to kilohertz, you can just make the neurons faster by just having a little bit more of picoamps inside and then allowing them to fire at you know, 10, 12, 20 kilohertz. Like this is sort of a ReLU type transfer function. Now we try to look at the learning as well. Uh, we basically converted images. This is, again, just a basic benchmark. It's not very useful. But we are converting images into spikes. White pixels are low firing rates. Black pixels are high firing rates. We cranked up the time constants. So just after, after 10 milliseconds, you can show that the synaptic weight uh, matrix which was 28 by 28, memorizes the pattern. So this is not learning. It's really storing. It's just memorizing. And the longer you wait, the more faithful is the memory of the, of the input pattern you're trying to impress on the synaptic matrix. And this is just to show you that we can do it with different types of images. But we also can train to generalize. So in that case, we were using multiple instances of different images of the characters of the MNIST data set. And so here you get these templates, which generalize to the template of 1, 2, 3, 4. And this, in this case, we slow down the time constant just to show that we can have learning on slow time scales, which is useful when we are trying, for example, to train a network to recognize speech, to correlate my phoneme of 50 milliseconds ago with the phoneme that's coming out now. So we need these long time constants uh, in the chip if we want really to match the signals to the time constants of the sensory inputs that we are getting. This, again, is just a standard benchmark because everybody does MNIST. So we thought if we don't do it, the review reviewers will ask us to do it. We'll just do it anyways. And again, this is just another, just to brag about the specs. The, the chip is shown here. I don't want you to look at all these numbers, but we are comparing to previous generations of our own chips, which are 2180 nanometer. But we're also comparing to the True North chip, which was a 28 nanometer. I think four is True North. Oh, no, sorry, five is True North. The, the, this column here is True North. And this one is an is a academic project that also is using 28 nanometer by University of Leuven. Charlotte Frankel did a really amazing job. And if you look at the numbers, you'll see that the one that we have here is the lowest power. If you look at the synaptic operations, the energy per synaptic operation, 
we are about a factor of 10 uh, less than the state of the art or uh, five less than the state of the art. And if you look at, for example, at the fan out and fan in, which allows you to have flexible uh, network configurations, deep networks, convolutional networks, recurrent networks, we are allowing uh, much greater flexibility in programming these devices. Uh, some of you that use True North know that you have to basically sacrifice cores if you want to do complex network architectures. In our case, we don't, just because we learned from previous experiences. Finally, how do you, uh, there was the argument of uh, this is going to replace standard computing and, and, and Mr. Turing is going to get very upset. I, I also don't agree. Uh, I think that these uh, types of chips are really good for real-time processing of sensory data uh, that, that require ultra low power and a small volume, so the, a niche of target applications, and that require low latency. Typical examples are drones. If you want to put something on drones that's really, really fast, that has a small weight and runs with a lithium battery, this has high potential. Uh, you should not use these types of chips for doing high accuracy pattern recognition, high precision number crunching, or batch processing of data sets. As soon as you need to transfer data from a hard disk or a, or a flash disk, to the chip, you lose all the advantage of these low power chips. To give you an idea, if you, if you do spike-based processing of a sensory signal, for example, an ECG or an EMG, directly connected to the op amps here, sorry, the con con converters here, the whole classification task takes about 38, 40 microwatts. So this is the type of uh, power consumption we are worried about, 30 microwatts. Ideally, we are trying to push below the one microwatt, but that's, that's very challenging. And finally, well, what is the killer app? There was the, the discussion of what is the killer app. For this, uh, the type of chips that we build, I argue that we are in a good position because now we're moving from an era in which we had mainframes to the era when I was growing up where we had uh, home computers, now to where we are, where we have computers in our, in our pockets with our cell phones. Finally, we're getting to a position where there's going to be many, many devices spread out around the environment in this room, in our car, in our refrigerator, that will do local sensing and that will have to report very simple outputs like a LED flashing uh, without having to connect to the cloud. These chiplets are the ones that might benefit from this ultra low power brain-like computation. And this is, I think, is gonna be one of the first killer apps of the neuromorphic technology that I showed, these uh, subthreshold analog and asynchronous digital circuits. And if you really want to uh, think hard about it, you know, you could imagine that these chips could be useful in health monitoring, prosthetic controls. They really not interface nicely to real neurons. They don't burn the neurons they touch because they don't heat up too much, unlike digital systems. So they could be good for prosthetics, body area networks, uh, intelligent watchdogs of more complex systems like the uh, ones that Intel is proposing or other type of applications. But the most interesting thing for me is really the type of research that this uh, leads to. As I told you, we are really trying to understand how the brain works. So at the university, that's, the ma that's our main goal, to understand the principles of computation by looking at real brains, but also by building artificial brains. And again, my argument is that if you want to get an intelligence to emerge, you need to have a body. And so in our institute, we are really trying to close the loop with, I should say, neuroscience models, microelectronics, and then robotics. And you will see, as I said, examples of that in the next day or, or so. So thank you for, uh, sorry, I would like to thank the funding organizations, but importantly, you for your attention and time. So we have time for one question, I think, while Nick sets up. You have this square root of log n, but you need log n bits to identify a neuron. So I mean, you, you need log n bits just for the ID. So how can you route something the, even by processing less than what you need to no, identify? No, the ID is intrinsic. Whenever the neuron fires, it puts its own address in. So the, ad the position of the neuron in the physical space is the address. That's why we, we don't have to encode the position. It's the physical space that encodes the position. No, but I mean, but, but this. This is, not, I mean, doesn't matter how you encode the number, you still need n bits of, you still need log two n bits of information. So the bus has that because it's, it, it, the encoder just looks at x and y coordinate and has this log n. But you don't need memory to store that. It's the, the memory is actually the physical, the instantiation of the circuit in the chip area. You don't need to put this number in another memory bank. It's the physical, whenever the neuron fires, it puts out its x and y address on the bus. I mean, sure, but you need to route it somewhere else. But that's, that's in this uh, F square root part. The, the routing part is in the square root. The, the address of the, of the neuron is in a physical location, which takes up resources. It takes up silicon area. 
So it, it is like having a memory. OK. OK. Thank you, Giacomo.